This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is a big week in the sporting calendar. We got men's college basketball conference tournaments coming up. The players in golf is coming up. We're going to talk about those the next couple of days. But today, we're going to kick off the week by talking about some NBA and NHL with Tom Vecchio. He'll break down his favorite bets for both those across FanDuel Sportsbook to get you ready for what should be a fun week. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonnis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as mentioned by Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah, it's certainly uh, an interesting time. We're coming to the close of NBA and NHL. Uh, a lot of teams, you know, making the final playoff pushes, getting things ironed out. And then, you know, college basketball and March Madness is right around the corner. It is, which means I have to do my like jam session in terms of like studying because I don't have time to pay attention to college basketball most of the year. Luckily, I'm not giving out advice, so it doesn't matter that I'm not uh, paying attention. But like I have to like ask competent questions, not sound right. like a moron, which is difficult. So I'm trying to jam stuff in, trying to watch Northwestern be the two seed in the Big Ten uh, men's tournament. You know, um, who could have predicted that? So we're slowly ramping back up. Luckily, talking to you talking to Brandon, talking to Austin about uh, NBA and NHLs, hopefully um, made my like overall knowledge there a bit more passable, but obviously not going to give out advice. I'm going to lean on you once again, Tom, to break down the NBA, break down some NHL. We'll talk about uh, wrapping up the trade deadline as well in the NHL to tie the, or to close the loop on our discussion from last Thursday there. We'll dive into that in just one second, but first a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread to get these podcasts as they are posted. Brandon Gadula is with us tomorrow talking NBA and the PGA uh, for the players. Massive field there. A lot of money to be distributed. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Wednesday, Ed Feng will be in talk about some men's college basketball conference tournaments. Ed will be with us next week, too, for our NCAA tournament podcast. Bennett Corcoran back with us uh, next week as well on Monday. Um, from uh, we'll have, We've had him on the past couple of years to talk about NCAA tournament. He'll be with us Monday for the bracket breakdown. Ed will talk futures with us on Tuesday. To get all those as they are posted, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Tom, let's start things off here by talking about tonight's NBA slate. It is a six gamer. And when you look at the traditional market bets across those six games, any bets stand out to you there at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, starting off with the Celtics. I like them plus six. And the Celtics are coming off of very exciting game last night, you know, double overtime uh, versus the Knicks. The Knicks are you know, fr- flying like right now. There was a nine game winning streak, but Celtics plus six at the Cavaliers, I think, is a bit of an overreaction. And there's a lot going on in this game. First off, uh, the Celtics, they don't have Rob Williams. They announced that prior to yesterday's game, he's going to be out for seven or ten days. They are on a back-to-back, which means they might not have Al Horford. Uh, They've been, you know, he's a veteran. They've been known to rest Al Horford at times this year. The Cavaliers also have uh, Donovan Mitchell, their best player, listed as questionable tonight. So a lot going on in this game. We're not seeing any player props posted yet, but the Celtics plus six. The Celtics are arguably the best team in the league. So I think this line is a bit of an overreaction to you know, some of these external circumstances. The Celtics still have Jason Tatum. They still have Jalen Brown. They still have Derek White. They still have Malcolm Brogdon. They still have Marcus Smart. Like this is a really good team that just happens to be in a particularly like unique circumstance between a few injuries, a back to back against another good team. I'm not going to say the Cavaliers are as good as the Celtics. So I will take probably one of the biggest lines we've seen with the Celtics this year. They've been the best team in the league up until, you know, the past few days when they dropped a few games. So plus six just seems like too many points. Does the the six point spread here mean to you the market expects Mitchell to play? Um, is that kind of your read on that? I, I think so. I think it's a combination of, you know, he's just listed as questionable. He's been playing in recent games. Yeah. It's not like a, a serious injury. Um, you know, they are missing Rob Williams, who is a very good defensive center, but you know, both teams are in the bottom 10 of the league when it comes to offensive pace, or bottom half of the league, I should say, when it comes to offensive pace. Like, this does not set up. It also is the lowest over under on the slate. So it's like yeah. it's set up to be this normal defensive style game that both of these teams are very good at. And I think the six points, if that's the case, is just too many. 
Yeah. So the six point spread there for the Celtics and the Cavaliers. Any thought to you, Tom, to waiting here until we get confirmation Mitchell will play to see if that moves the market? Or do you think that's baked in enough where we won't see things move too dramatically, even if he does get ruled in officially? Yeah, I think it's fine where it is because okay. the, the, we're also waiting on injuries for the Celtics. Like sure. if they rule out Al Horford, like that's not sure. going to change it too much. Sure. Uh, so I'll just take the six points now. And if it if it happens to get to seven or whatever it might be, I'd still be comfortable with that. Okay, so Celtics plus six, where Tom is looking at there. What about for player props in the NBA, Tom? Anything stand out to you there? Yeah, starting off, let's go to Denver uh, hosting the Toronto Raptors. And we know that Jokic is awesome at all of these things. And, you know, a lot of people look to Jokic for – you know, a, a conversation we've had is like, where can you find value in Jokic props? It's triple yeah. double, it's a PRA, but I also like to flip things on the other side. It's okay, what is Jokic great at? And I just spoke about this with, with Ben Stevens on Sirius XM a few minutes ago. It's like, what is Jokic great at? Well, he's great at rebounding the ball. And what does that mean? It means that Nuggets are on the fourth fewest rebounds per game to opposing centers, which means what? Well, the opposing centers don't necessarily have big games. So that means Jakob Hurdle for the Toronto Raptors under eight and a half rebounds, staying at minus 113. Both teams are in the bottom 10 league when it comes to offensive pace. Uh, you know, the, the Nuggets are solid on defense. So Jokic is obviously the front runner for MVP, third time in a row, et cetera, et cetera. Like he does all these great things. People are still going to have these massive gains. It's like, okay, if he does something well, there may not be value on his prop just because the rebound, it might be juiced. But what does that mean? How do we like, I always say it's like reverse engineer. It's like, well, that means the opposing team is not going to be getting a lot of rebounds. That means unders for their rebounding prop. And I think that that's, that's a correlated market. So you think you go into the assumption. Your assumption is Nikola Jokic, the MVP leader right now, is good at basketball. I think that's a fair assumption to make, Tom, going out on a limb, despite my limited NBA knowledge, fair assumption that he's good. And then you ask, what's the best market for taking advantage of that assumption? And I think this makes a lot of sense. Pirtle right now, as you mentioned, under 8.5, minus 111 at FanDuel Sportsbook on that number. So what you're doing is basically just going in and trying to find a different route, the best route for betting, an assumption you have. And again, that assumption is a very fair one to make right now. Right. So it, it's it's not only, um, it's like some, you know, in baseball, you can, there's some some books offer like pitcher props where like you can take hits against or earn runs or like what yeah. it, it's like, I'm not only betting, like, I don't want to lay like, you know, we, we've talked about this before, like you may lay like, be willing to lay like minus 250 on a on money line. Yeah. But if you're going to, if that team's in a spot to win, it's like, okay, that pitcher's probably going to be giving up a lot of runs right. so you can attack it from a different way. Right. And like other things too, like uh, outs recorded, they right. have that yeah. available. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think that the pitcher struggles with pitch count, you could bet their strikeout prop under, or you could take the outs recorded under. There, there are multiple exactly. routes to doing that too. So I think just having that thought process of, okay, here's my assumption what's the best way to exploit this asking yourself that is always a key thing and like there are sites i talk about betscope quite a bit on the show but like betscope allows you to put in like an assumption and it'll find like good ways to bet that so you there are markets or things out there that could help you with those assumptions but i think just kind of going through that thought process is pretty helpful uh any other props you like for tonight in the nba yeah one other uh dom de sabonis of the sacramento kings they are hosting the new orleans pelicans uh, De'Aaron Fox, the point guard for the Kings, is listed as questionable. So turning to Sabonis, their next best player, over 33.5 points plus rebounds. Uh, it was sitting at minus 118 just a little while ago. The Pelicans ha uh, still have their starting center, Jonas Valanciunas, listed as questionable. He's missed a few games in a row. Uh, still with them in the lineup. They are bottom 10 in the league for points allowed per game to opposing centers and bottom half when it comes to rebounds. Uh, Sabonis's recent game log, not only recent, but really just this entire season, has been awesome. Uh, constantly pushing towards a triple double, these big 24, 14, you know, 18, 17 games where he's just piling up the stats is great to see. Both teams top half league when it comes off the pace, as is the 237 over under, as is reflected, like dramatically different compared to the Cavs and the Celtics, which is at like 218 and a half. Like a 20 point difference is massive. So, you know, if, if the starting point guard for the Kings is out, it just means more touches for Sabonis, who's already awesome to begin with. That number, as you mentioned, uh, for Sabonis in the points plus rebounds department is over 33 and a half, minus 118 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Pretty limited props to this game up, I'm assuming because of De'Aaron Fox, right. but um, Sabonis is tied to him too, it sounds like, based on your the way you you broke that down. So I'm kind of surprised it's actually posted personally. Uh, it, he's tied to it in a, in some capacity. Like the matchup yeah. and the over-under is, is still so good. The Pelicans are, are weak yeah. on defense, so... You know, he could get to this with Fox in the game. Sure. Okay. 
So uh, Sabonis again, 33 and a half points plus rebounds, minus 118 on the over there. Anything else in the NBA, Tom, before you shift focus to the NHL? No, I think it's looking, uh, you know, Celtics, a couple player props. Um, I would have interest in ultimately the Nuggets under just because I, that's sure. how I expect the game to play out. I don't think the, the as I've said before about the Raptors, like they can't necessarily get in like these track meet games yeah. with opposing teams. So that would be my only other take for the NBA. Okay, so let's shift focus now and talk about some NHL. We had you on on Thursday, Tom, which was pre-deadline. And there were some more trades Thursday and then Friday before the deadline as well. So we talked about the Patrick Kane move and stuff like that. Uh, What other moves that went down after we talked do you think have an impact in terms of betting teams going forward in the NHL? Uh, There weren't many big name uh, acquisitions. The Penguins made a few trades, um, picking up Mikhail Granlin, picking up Nick Benino, who are like you pick up those players are like, okay, I see what you're doing. You are like trying to sure up and solidify like your bottom six role, like bottom six uh, forwards, your role players, which are good moves. Like those moves don't move the needle too much. So how would I uh, take that and turn it into a betting angle for the Penguins? It's like, okay, maybe is there a market to attack the Penguins uh, just to make the playoffs? Because I think that does strengthen their team overall. Like these aren't flashy moves, but it does make them like incrementally better. So if you could find the Penguins to make the playoffs or take, maybe start taking some unders on them just because they're trying to play a slower defensive style, just because they've been struggling on defense. They like, they can't push the pace. So they have to play a more controlled style, which is we're kind of what these players are. They're, you know, defensive minded, not offensive first players. They have the offense with Crosby and Gensel and Malkin and all these players. So I would lean towards unders moving forward and then maybe just outright to make the playoffs for the Penguins. It's minus 340 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Okay. Is it's that too? Three. Yeah. Too far? It, it's too much. That would, it'd have to be on a game by game basis. Sure. It's yeah. probably also because they have, I think, three games in hand on the aisles. Uh, right. who they're they're jockeying for a wild card position. So they have like three or four games in hand. So right. and they're and they're in a wild card spot right now with games right. in hand. So it does make sense. Uh I didn't know it was 340, but that, that's a But I think that the overall thought process of they're now better, you can apply right. that to game by game betting as well. Right. So right. unders or uh yeah, unders okay. I wouldn't say puck line because they just don't necessarily have the offense always to push sure. them to high goal totals. Sure. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, potentially buying the Penguins in the short term based on the small little moves they made. Let's shift focus now. Talk about the Monday night slate here in the NHL. Once again, a six gamer here as well. Let's start things off with the more traditional markets. Tom, where are you seeing value there? Uh, that first game listed on the slate, the Oilers to win in sixty minutes. Oilers in regulation is minus one hundred four. They are coming off. Uh, I want to say I don't want to say a bad loss, but you know, they're, they're giving up all these goals to the Jets. Leon Dreisaitl for the Oilers had a, a hat trick. And, you know, you score, your team scores four or five goals and you still lose. Like, it is what it is. It happens in the NHL. But the Oilers are a good team. They are better than the Sabres. I expect this to be a very high scoring game as the seven over under would indicate what we get near even money for the better team with the best player in the world with Connor McDavid, who's on a record point pace, all these sorts of things. We also see the Sabres over the last month. They are allowing way too many goals per 60 minutes in 5v5 situations. It's over 3.3. I will take the best offense in the league going up against a struggling defense all the time. So I want to ask you about this. Uh, the total, as you mentioned, is seven goals. Um, the Oilers to win straight up are minus 164, their money line there. Right. To win a regulation is minus 106. Do you think that your desire to bet the 60 minute money line versus the traditional money line differs based on the total in that game because to me more goals implies i don't know a little bit less variance i'm not sure if that makes a lot of sense but to me more goals implies less variance which means i should be more okay betting a team to win in regulation versus the full the full market do you have any sort of tie in your brain or is there a tie that you've researched between total goals in the game versus betting them to win a regulation versus the full market? Or what's your view of that? Is there a relationship there or is it kind of a non-factor? Um, I mean, that, that's a tough question because we see so many, like the stars play the abs on Saturday and that was seven to three stars. So there's a massive amount of goals and yeah. like, I don't think, I don't know. I'd have to do like some serious research to say, yeah. so I, the answer is I don't have an answer right sure. now. Okay. Um, but that is an interesting point is like, how do the goal totals and the expectation of goal totals right. essentially impact the money line versus the, the regulation line? 
Right. Yeah. Because like for me, thinking of it from a baseball perspective, I know I am more willing to bet a larger money line underdog if I expect to be a lower scoring game. Because right. to me, that introduces more variance, more odds that one run is a difference. So that's the way it works in my brain. But that's also different when it's a betting in regulation market versus betting overall. So right. uh, minus 164 on the Oilers to win overall, but minus 106 is where Tom is going for them to win in regulation. What else are you seeing in the traditional markets here in the NHL tonight? The Ottawa Senators, their puck line, so minus one and a half for the Senators, uh, sitting at minus 110, going up against the Chicago Blackhawks. The Senators have been unbelievable on offense. Uh, over the last month, they are scoring 3.44 goals per 60 minutes in 5v5 situations, which is the third best in the league. They made a, a few trades at the deadline. They picked up uh, picked up uh, Jacob Chikrin, the uh, offensive defenseman from the Arizona Coyotes. They are pouring in goals, five, six goals a game, and they're going up against Chicago, who's one of the worst defenses in the league over the last month, over the entire season. So the puck line for the Senators, minus one and a half, which means they have to win by two. So a four to two game, a five to two game is very, very possible. And again, that one directly correlates to the total market. Total in that game is six and a half uh, with the over at minus 104. Tom's going with the puck line minus one and a half, which is minus 110 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook again for the Senators and the Blackhawks. Right. So if you if you look at the, the Senators team total in that game, yeah. it's three and a half and it's right. minus 150 or minus 152 on the over, Okay, which is the, which is the expectation for them to score right. as they've right. been doing. So right. in line with that, a player prop I like in that game would be Brady Kachuk score goal at plus 134. Okay. Uh, so, it, you know, he top forward line, top power play. He has one goal over his past five games, despite their scoring outburst, which is like four or five plus goals in, in five straight games. He has one goal over this time. Right. He has this high shot volume. It's like all these things I talked about last week when, you know, we did get that Jordan Cairo goal. Um for the blues uh, on Thursday last week. Like it's the same thing. Like we have these high shot volumes on you know prominent offensive roles for these players and they're just not scoring. It's like they're due for that positive regression. I was going to see if Andrew would let me do a same game parlay of uh, the Kachuk goal and the run and the puck line. They would not. So we gave it a shot at least. Um, but uh, Tom does like the to Chuck to score a goal. Uh, market that is plus 134 but then also senators puck line minus one and a half so the, the kachuk one is the first player prop what are the player props you like here across monday night in the nhl the uh matt duchene for the nashville predators visiting the vancouver canucks so the predators made some trades not in a good way trading players away uh they're also hit with some injuries where phil forsberg their best offensive player is out uh, they're starting or top line center. Ryan Johansson is also out due to injuries. And this leaves Matt Duchesne as like realistically their best forward. And when you have forwards on the top six of an NHL team that I've never heard of is a shock. Like they're calling up players from the age, like their team's not in a good spot. So they're, yeah. they're trading away players. Um, Mikhail Grandin, who I mentioned for the Penguins, he was on Nashville. So trades and injuries uh, massively impacting the Predators in a negative way. Leaves Matthew Shane as clearly their best forward. So it's only two and a half shots. It's sitting on minus 130. I think that's a very fair line. Uh, I think the prop is fine. I think the juice is fine. He's on a line where the other players should be deferring to him to be the primary shooter for their offense. So... Vancouver, one of the bottom five teams in the league, like too much of it makes sense. And honestly, minus 130, I might think is not enough. I'd be willing yeah. to go to minus 150 on this spot. So Deshane over two and a half shots right now. If Angel Sportsbook is a uh, minus 130, that's in the Predators versus Canucks game. You can bet some alt overs, uh, the four plus shots on goal for Deshane, two to one. Is that too ambitious or what are you thinking about that in the alt market? No, I think I think this is the opportunity to take these types of like shots, not not sure. not in terms of shots on goal, but like this type of betting shot yeah, where yeah. he can get to he's gotten to four and five in a lot of these recent games. So if right. you wanted to put this like laddering strikeout price. Right. So right. if you want to put a unit on over two and a half, a half a unit, and then a quarter unit, whatever it might be, I think this sure. is a very reasonable spot where we have so many things piling up. Like it's not necessarily like what we talk about, like the paths to hitting it over, yeah. but there's just so many factors that are so positive for Duchesne tonight. I think the paths argument revolves around the trades, though, where right. 
there are fewer fewer paths to him not getting there um, <laughs> with with fewer other options. Um, so I think that that makes sense. Okay, so if you're betting one though, you want the traditional market over two and a half minus one thirty, correct? Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so that's Matt Duchesne in the Predator versus Canucks game. Over two and a half shots, minus 130 in that one. That is Tom Vecchio. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. You can find his NBA work on the Daily ISO on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast. You can find his uh, written work over at numberfire.com. Tom, I appreciate the time as always. Good luck to you tonight in the NBA and NHL. We'll talk to you once again here very soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. All righty. Again, check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. If you want to place an NBA DFS tonight, check out the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed for the daily ISO. We're going to recap what went down here on the show last week, go through the bets recommended in a good week in racing in just one second. But first, the midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and three strain. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online, a real money wager only. $10 deposit required. Refund issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text NEXT STEP to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Kansas and Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700 or in Kansas, ksgamblinghelp.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghelp.org. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and Y. In West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's take a look back at last week here on the show and go back through the bets recommended to let you know uh, from a transparency perspective how things went. We'll start things off in the EPL. We had Austin Cass on. Check out Austin on Twitter, at Austin Cass. And Austin had a very good week on the EPL side of things. On Saturday, he hit on Southampton to win. We said we preferred uh, the market where there was a tie no bet. That one was even money. So it was uh, even money on Southampton. The reason we went there was because there was a lower hold in that market. That was even money. If you took them to win uh, with a tie in the market, it was plus 175. They won 1-0, so there was a reason we took the tie, no bet market. Um, I want lower hold markets in general, but we'll take even money on the win there. But uh, kudos to you if you hit it on a uh, plus 175 for them to win uh, in the tie offered market. Other bet was Liverpool plus 135 to beat Manchester United, and they won 7-0. So easy win there. Good call by Austin on that one. A really no sweat bet there on Sunday with the Liverpool one. The one player prop was Kai Havertz to score or assist in the Chelsea Leeds match at plus 105. Chelsea did win 1-0. Havertz did not assist in the one goal, but a great week by Austin regardless. Check him out on Twitter at Austin Cass. We have Brandon Gadula on to preview the Arnold Palmer Invitational. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula13. Check out his Sims for the players if you want those uh, with markets now open over on numberfire.com. Kurt Kitayama won it. Really thrilling day in the PGA. A bunch of guys in contention at the end, but Kitayama did the dang thing. Really nice pot in 18 to win it. Uh, Brandon's outrights were Xander Schauffele, 24 to 1. Tony Finau, 26. Patrick Cantley, 23. Cantley finished just two shots off the leads. So he was in contention there. Um, he finished up pretty early, so you kind of knew he wasn't going to win, but Cantley golfed well. Uh, first time for him at the Arnold Palmer. Schauffele in contention the first two days fell off over the weekend, but um, Cantley was right there. The top 20 bet for Xander was, or for, uh, for Brandon, I should call him Xander, uh, was Brian Harmon. He was plus 320. He missed the cut. Uh, that's kind of how golf goes. We'll bounce back and talk about the players with Brandon for tomorrow. Again, check out Brandon on Twitter at Kadula13. Racing bets for me went really well, and I definitely got lucky. Um, there was luck involved, but you know, 
no complaints at all. We'll go chronologically here, starting with Friday night. Uh, that was the truck series. The bets are recommended were Ty Majeski top five at plus 170, Carson Hosevar top five at three to one. Majeski finished fifth, so that cashed at plus 170. Hosevar finished seventh, so he just missed. Uh, got pretty close there. Profit regardless with Majeski in the top five at plus 170. Then Saturday, only Xfinity Series bets I had were Austin Hill. Uh, they centered around him. I had value on him to win at 20 to 1. I said if you wanted to avoid Kyle Bush, you could take Hill top five at plus 250, both of which were values from me. Hill was running second the entire third stage. He's about two and a half seconds behind leader Chandler Smith. Smith is a guy I was on for Fontana, was not on him here. So I had Hill in a group bet against Smith and Hill to win. So I was one of the top five, but really wanted him to pass Chandler Smith. And he started to dig, really pulled him in. Uh, Hill caught him, passed him on the last lap, won the race. So 20 to one winner cashed. Uh, if you took the plus 250 for a top five, you're happy as well. Uh, but really nice to hit that. Um, currently revamping my Xfinity Series Sims, uh, thanks to the fix I mentioned last week via the help from Brandon Gadula, applying that to the Xfinity Series. So that was the final week for the old model. Went out on a high note with the Austin Hill win, uh, but I still think the new model is a better way to go. Two bets for Formula One. Um, they looked real bad uh, on Sunday morning. Looked bad Saturday post-qualifying. The two bets we discussed in the show uh, were Lewis Hamilton to podium at plus 190 and Pierre Gasly to finish in the points at plus 110. Hamilton qualified seventh. Not good for a podium finish. Gasly qualified dfl he had a lap deleted in the first round didn't make it out of the second round or the first round regardless but uh then had a lap deleted he started dead last hamilton finished fifth he would have needed a lot of attrition to finish on the podium so i didn't think he finished two spots off but he didn't have the speed to compete with carlos Sainz or fernando alonso alonso passed him pretty late but a lot better tire de degradation for alonso you know i didn't deserve to win that bet ghastly though was awesome. Uh, he short pitted twice. So what that means is he pitted before others to get fresher tires on and have a speed advantage for a bit. That would mean he'd have less speed later on, but he pitted for the first time in 18th was then running 13th, picked his way through a couple of guys was running 11th and uh, Charles Leclerc retired and that got Gasly into the top 10. So Gasly running top 10 pits for fresh tires as did a lot of cars behind him. So Gasly passes Alex Albon to get up to ninth. He was running down Valtteri Botas for eighth. Didn't quite get there. Finished about a second behind, but uh, Gasly finished ninth inside the points. So plus one ten cash there. Got very lucky with Gasly. I know it's it's not luck entirely because part of the bet is he's a fast car and fast cars can make passes. But um, I still felt pretty lucky to win that one for sure. I felt very stupid Sunday morning based on those uh, bets, but uh, Gasly made some magic. So that was nice. Didn't deserve uh, to win the Hamilton bet. So. Uh, deserved loss there. Cup Series was Sunday night. I had three to or four top tens there. Austin Dillon plus two fifty. Austin Cindric plus three eighty. Ty Gibbs four to uh, plus four ten. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. at five to one. This one I probably should have whipped entirely on, uh, but there was a late caution. I, I believe Cindric took four tires, while most others took two. So he was able to make up a lot of ground in the restart. And he actually finished inside the top ten. Finished as the highest finishing forward. I had that at uh, fourteen to one. So. I didn't recommend that in the show, so no credit for that. But depends on how you scale those top tens, whether you cashed or whether you profited. But uh, and again, probably didn't deserve that one. But you know, it felt good to win the hill bet on Saturday uh, to get the Cindric top four bet at fourteen to one. I had an Almarola group bet where another book badly mispriced him at thirty five to one to win a group and got lucky there too to win that one. But really good week. Uh, feel good about the the F one Sims. I think making an adjustment up for Aston Martin bump down for Mercedes should make things a lot better heading into Saudi uh, in a couple of weeks, but feel pretty good about that. So fun week in racing, profitable week in racing. Hopefully it was the same for you, whether it be racing golf, uh, uh, EPL, whatever it may have been. Hopefully you had a good week as well. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread back once again, tomorrow talks some NBA and the players uh, with Brandon Gadula to get his read on those. It's a men's college basketball coming up on Wednesday, all right here in the same feed. So make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Big thank you once again to Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. 
You can find me on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across the NBA and the NHL. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs>